Well, good morning to everybody and happy new year. As we begin this new Roman year uh, in the Lord, uh, he has much in store for us. You know, if you remember our last jumpstart word ending 2022 was keep going. And Holy Spirit was encouraging us to remember just to stay the course, regardless of what natural circumstances seem to be. We trust him. He is changeless. Uh, he's undefeated. And he is calling us to go with him. Well, this year, our first word for jumpstart is a new level of belief. Now, again, I'm no prophet, but what I'm sensing in the Lord is he's saying that this particular year uh, is going to be very special for his children and his kingdom. We know it has to come at some point. We know the world as it is right now is not the way God desires it to be. So he is in the process of changing that, and he's calling us to join him with that. So that being said, uh, Abba, Father, in Christ's name and your Holy Spirit, we ask that, uh, uh, first of all, we just thank you for this new year. We thank you for guiding us uh, powerfully through last year and accomplishing your purposes in and through our lives. And Holy Spirit, we're asking that you be our rabbi today, and you are the encourager, the, you're the comforter, the helper, consoler, you're the wisdom of God, the power of God in the earth upon us and within us. And so we're asking that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to obey what you have for us today. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Well, in praying through this, um, the Lord took me to John 11, and you know the story well. It's one of the most famous stories in the New Testament. It's the raising of Lazarus. I mean, even non-believers uh, have heard something about Lazarus. But there are some elements in this that I believe Holy Spirit is wanting us to grasp. We don't put God in a box. It's not that we can predict him, but there is a template or an overlay in this story. I believe that God uses time and time again in our own lives. So we'll just see what he has to say. Well, you know the predicament. Uh, now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. That's verse one. Interestingly, Lazarus means one whom God helps. So that's prophetic right there. But you see that John said, now a certain man was ill. Well, in this, we could always be certain that God is certainly aware of the specific needs of your life because your father knows what you need before you ask him, just as Christ said in Matthew 6, 8. So right away, in the meta narrative of the world in our lives and Christ's purposes, John tells us a certain man was sick. So what we can know from this is God specifically knows what you need. He's with you. With all that's happening in the world, with all that's going on in his cosmos, the Lord is certainly aware of you, and he's known the certain details of your life even before you were born. So he has a plan for that. So be hopeful in that. And don't forget that fact. Don't forget that fact. Well, the prayer. So the sisters sit to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now we can know this. You know, loyalty and love for God do not make you immune from challenges. Nor do they manipulate him into doing anything about them. But this state of heart does give direct access in Christ to his heart. And the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working, as we see in James 5.16. Now, we already know through the Gospels that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus had a particularly intimate relationship with Yeshua. They were very close to him. They loved him. They were very loyal to him. They welcomed him in their home. Uh, they had a very close relationship. Well, that proximity to Christ physically and spiritually did not make them immune from the challenges of life. Lazarus, the one Christ loved dearly, did become sick. And it was a terminal illness. So our love for Christ doesn't automatically make us immune from difficulties and challenges in this world. They do still come. That does not mean that we are faithless. It does not mean necessarily that we've done something wrong. It certainly doesn't mean that God has stopped loving us. 
But there are those things that come. And also we can understand that when we pray to the Lord, that prayer is not an automatic manipulation. You know, just because we pray doesn't mean that God has to do something in a certain way at a certain time. And that's important for us to understand that. But they offer that prayer. Well, there was a prophecy in this in verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Well, this is really compelling. Now, again, you know, in our modern Western uh, English mindset, we miss many things uh, in Scripture, Old and New Testament. But we've got to get in the mindset of a first century Jew. As we're interpreting Scripture, how did they see it? When they heard these words, what did they mean to them? What was the cultural context? Well, in the English, we say it does not lead to death. And that's not necessarily wrong there. But actually, what he said was this does not lead to Thanatos. Well, what's Thanatos or who is Thanatos? Thanatos is the god of death. And by extension, it means the state of being dead. But here's the deal. Yeshua was about to prove that his authority as the God of life ultimately overcomes the power of the lesser God, death, Thanatos. It's Mavith in Hebrew. In the Old Testament, uh, it appears as Mavith, that name, same evil being. So Christ is calling out and dealing directly with the demonic evil spirit, the God of death. And the Jews saw it that way. They understood there were these evil demonic lesser God beings that were against them. So Christ is saying, this isn't going to end up with a victory for Thanatos. I'm going to prove to you that the God of life is greater than the lesser God of death. And it was going to be a stunning blow to this vile and sworn enemy of God and us. So there's a lot, a lot in that statement from Yeshua. Well, the protraction. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So when you're focused, your heart and obedience are toward God, and he allows a challenge or scheme of the enemy to play out in your life, you can be confident that he has a great and loving purpose in it. Well, we were talking in small group on Wednesday, and the Lord had me share this uh, with them as well. But that doesn't make a lot of sense to us initially. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. That doesn't that didn't seem to jive, does it? You would think John would say, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So he stopped what he was doing. He threw it all down, and he ran back to help them. That's kind of the way we would think. We think, Lord, shouldn't it work that way? But John says he loved them so much that he didn't come right away. That's an odd thing, isn't it? Well, let's see. There was a protraction. There was delay. And that's something that we need to understand also. If you're praying over something right now, uh, maybe it's a hardship. Maybe it's a good thing, a desire, whatever it is. And there, it's not coming. There's a protraction in that. Well, if you're not in a state of rebellion... You know, if you're wanting what God wants and you're seeking him and your desire is to walk with him every day and you're praying over something and it hasn't been fulfilled yet, just hang on because God has a greater purpose in mind. Well, the plan. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Verse 7. Now, more than going back into the region of his earthly enemies, Yeshua was intentionally going up directly against the lesser God of death himself. You can't defeat an enemy you're not willing to face. And that's key as well. You know, the, there are challenges in our lives. There's things that we want uh, to overcome. What well, the Lord's saying, I want you to overcome that with me and in me. But in order to do that, you got to face that thing. So Christ can't overcome death if he's not willing to face death. He can't overcome Thanatos if he's not willing to face Thanatos. And so he was always willing to do that in his father's time and in his father's way. So that was his plan. He was going right up against it. Well, the prohibition. 
The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Here's the thing. When you are obediently walking in God's plan, those around you, even those who love you most, may not initially understand or support what you're doing, and they'll question your actions. And this is something that you may face, have already faced, will face, are facing, but when you're seeking the Lord, remember, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Now, he loves us all corporately, and we're all part of a family. But when it comes down to your relationship with Jesus, it's one-on-one. -on -one. You know, there's no surrogate relationship here. You don't follow the Lord through someone else. You follow him yourself. And there are times when the Lord will speak to you, and he may give you a word. He may give you an instruction. He may give you a vision, a dream, a hope, a, an assignment tell you that you have a mantle and those closest to you who those whom they have a great love for you they may not get it and they may not support it and they may even speak against it but you have to stay true to the lord in yourself and do what he's asking you to do and don't allow that to dissuade you now i'm not saying that the lord does not use others around our lives to give counsel of course he does and certainly we need to hear, but we need to test what's being said against what he has told you. And so stay true to him and stay true to that word, even when those around you don't understand it or don't support it. And there's a protection in that. And so you're going back into a place of danger, but Christ knew that he was protected in that. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him, verses 9 through 10. Now, remember, it was during the time of light that Jews, and of course Gentiles as well, could see what needed to be done and then work to accomplish it. You know, the, the Jewish work day was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Well, why would that be? Well, because that's the time of light. So when you can see what needs to be done, then you can you be guided by that and you can accomplish what's necessary. So Christ is applying this parabolically to spiritual light. And he's saying, I don't have to fear going up against Thanatos because I'm walking in the light. I, I see him. I see what he's doing. I, I, I'm very well enlightened by God. And I know exactly where to be, what to do, how to accomplish the tasks of the Lord. <clears throat> so Christ had come to accomplish the work of God's purposes and because he saw and walked in the wisdom of God's light, he never feared making the wrong move at the wrong time. Well, the parable, after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Verse 11, you know, Matthew 13, 34, all these things Jesus said to the crowd in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. You know, Christ always taught parabolically. He always taught metaphorically with word pictures and images and stories. And this was so that there could be a, a mental picture, a mental image in the minds of the listeners so that they could operate from that, even though he knew initially they weren't tracking with him at the deepest level. But nonetheless, they could remember the story. And then later, Holy Spirit could apply meaning to that. And so he was always teaching parabolically, and that's what he did here. He's fallen asleep. I'll go awaken him. Well, here's the thing. One who is asleep is not consciously and actively living life. When we're asleep, we're not consciously and actively living life. And that's a metaphor and a type there. But that one still has the potential to awaken to do so. So Christ came to be the ultimate help from God to awaken his people to the fact that they're missing out on true life. So Christ used the metaphor of sleep. He knows Lazarus is physically dead. He knows that. But he's saying it's like he's asleep because he has the potential to awaken and live life to the fullest. And that's what I'm going to do. Well, the problem, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant rest in sleep, verse 12. So though Christ's disciples were physically awake, they revealed that they were still spiritually asleep as they simply were not tracking with what Yeshua was teaching them. 
you know, God bless them and I'd be right there with them. Remember, they don't yet have Holy Spirit living within them. Christ had not yet died and paid the price for their sin. And Holy Spirit had not been granted to them within. He would come upon them at times to empower them in, in healing. And we see that through the Gospels, but he was not within them. So they're still uh, following Christ with their own natural mindedness. And, you know, every time he would say something spiritual, uh, they would track with it naturally. And here they are again. They're just missing. It's flying right over their head. But hearing Christ's words and understanding what he means are not automatically the same thing. You must be awake in his spirit to perceive and steward both well. And see, even though now if you're born again in this moment, uh, that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be tracking with God because you have to actively choose to surrender your soul, your mind to him. You have to ask him to teach you every day. Lord, what are you saying? What are you thinking? What does this mean? It's an active, ongoing relationship. But that was their problem is that Christ is teaching them spiritually they're tracking naturally, and they're missing it. Well, the plain truth. Then Jesus told them plainly, fellas, Lazarus has died. Lazarus has died. And died here is apopnesco, and it means to die off or to be dead. So Yeshua always meets us in the place where we are, but he teaches us from the place we need to be. He knows there's a gap between the two and graciously makes up the difference if we will stay with him. See, when Holy Spirit is speaking to you, when Jesus is speaking to you by Holy Spirit, he's speaking from the place you need to be, but he meets you in the place where you are. So he comes to the place where you are, but he's speaking to you to the place you need to be. Well, there's a gap, and he knows that. You know, when he, when he speaks a word to you, when he gives you a vision or a dream or a word, uh, or that you, you hear him speaking in your spirit, you know, you realize it's Christ, you realize he's saying something, but there's a gap. So he's come to you where you are, he's speaking to you in the moment, in that circumstance, but he's, he's talking to you from the place where he wants you to be, where you need to be. But if you'll stay with him, he realizes there's a gap between those two places. He will guide you, he will give you understanding, and he will help you get to that place. And see, that's exactly what he's doing here in this story with Lazarus, because he is wanting to take his closest followers to a new level of belief through what Holy Spirit's about to do with Lazarus. So that process is happening right here. Well, the promotion, and this is what we're talking about. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Verse 14. Now, Christ knew that saving Lazarus from terminal illness would certainly have been a miracle. You know, he, he's dying. It, the situation is dire. And the sisters send to him. That, that's the prayer. That's the type for prayers. They're, they're calling out to Christ. And he could have spoken a word and he would have been healed had that been God's will. But he also knew that resurrecting him after being dead for an extended time would elevate the faith of his followers to yet another level. But they already knew that, you know, he could heal them, heal him. But the idea that he could bring him back to life literally after his body was already deteriorating, well, that's a whole nother thing. So he was and is always working in the lives of his followers to promote their level of trust in him and belief in his abilities by Holy Spirit to bring them to a new spiritual normal in him. Isaiah 43, 19 says, you know, see, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? So the Lord is always working to take us to a new normal, a new level of belief. You know, it's great that you trust me for this, but I also want you to trust me for this. And so as we walk with him, then he takes us to deeper levels in him. And I really believe that's what the Lord is saying for this new year in him, for the body of Christ in his kingdom. He's saying, I know you're in a predicament, <laughs> and I know you're praying about it. And I know that it's been an extended period of time. You've been praying about this for a while. And you haven't really seen me, although I have been working, you haven't perceived it. But I want to take you to another level. And I really believe that that manifestation is about to be upon us. I don't know what, I don't know how, I don't know when. Again, I'm not a prophet, but I know by the word of God, he's not going to leave us in this circumstance. Just, he's just not. 
the throne of God's, I mean, the, the foundation of God's throne is justice. And he is the true and living God. He's the ultimate God. He's not going to allow injustice just to continue to dominate. It's not going to happen. So I can know by the authority of who he is and his word, he is going to change the circumstance. And so I really believe that, that there's an eminence to this word. But he's saying, I want to promote you. I'm always wanted to take you deeper in and higher up. I want to take you closer to me. I, I don't want you to live off of yesterday's miracle and yesterday's understanding. I want you to know that I'm, I'm deeper than that. I'm eternally deeper than that. You'll never get to the end of me. You'll never get to the bottom of who I am. You'll never reach the height of who I am. You'll never get there. So just stay with me, and I'm going to continue to take you deeper and deeper in. I want to promote you in that regard. Well, the process, but let us go to him, verse 15. See, God created all humans for relationship with him. That's why we exist. Thus, the only miracle Yeshua accomplished alone was his death, burial, and resurrection. He did that all by himself. He accomplished your salvation and my salvation all by himself. He deserves 100% of the credit for our salvation. He did it all by himself. But prior to that and afterwards, he always included and includes others in his earthly works. So the prayer for God to work powerfully within us and among us is the call for us to cooperate with him in doing so. So Christ said, let us go to him. So in that process, it's a cooperative effort. And that's what the Lord is saying also. You know, we sit back and we can point out a problem and the Lord is saying, well, if you're going to pray over that problem, I'm also asking you to be a part of the process of solving it with me. Well, the party pooper, I had to kind of stretch for some of these peas. <clears throat> Verse 16. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. You know, Thomas was kind of the Eeyore of the group. Um, I shared Wednesday. I really think that he uh, dealt with clinical depression. And he showed signs of that in the Gospels because Thomas apparently kind of had a melancholy spirit, and that was a challenge. That did, did, not, did not disqualify him from serving Jesus. Jesus chose him, but he seems to struggle with depression throughout the Gospels. And I think that's why he wasn't with the other ten when, when he was resurrected and he talked to them in that room. Thomas wasn't there. Now, Judas, of course, is out of the picture completely, but where was Thomas? Well, if he is a melancholy, if he does deal with depression, he's probably off alone by himself, depressed. So that could be why he wasn't there. So Thomas always kind of tend to look at the dark side of the thing, you know, the Eeyore side. Now, I'm not trying to criticize him. Actually, I hope this gives you hope because there are a lot of faithful believers who deal with depression. And the enemy would tell you, well, you don't have any faith if you're depressed. That's not true. It's tougher for some than others. And there are things that come against you. So if you're depressed right now or you deal with depression, don't you think you're not faithful? Don't you think it's some problem with you, but just trust the Lord with it because Christ chose Thomas for a reason and he loved him and he used Thomas powerfully. But I think we're seeing some of that manifest here. He's saying, you know, he just looks at the dark side of the thing. Well, let's go to Judea. He's going to be killed. We, we might as well die with him. But though all of Yeshua's original disciples initially failed him in his time of greatest crisis, remember, they all scattered. You know, Thomas said, let's go die with him. But when it came to the moment when it looked like that was going to happen, they're like, we're out of here. But Thomas' statement would prove to be prophetically true by Holy Spirit. Namely, the only parts of you that live eternally are the ones that first die in Christ. And Paul later said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. So only that in you that dies now gets to live forever. Anything that you try to maintain and uh, manipulate and keep alive on your own won't. Well, the platform. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead, excuse me, in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, verses 17 through 19. So God often allows a challenging situation to remain for an extended period in order to draw attention to it and to draw more people into it 
so that more can experience the blessing of the outcome in him. Now let's think back on this. When, when the sisters sent to Jesus, sent to Yeshua and said, hey, Lazarus is sick. And, Laz and Jesus hears that. Yeshua could have said, uh, be healed, you know, from where he was. And, and he could have taken care of that illness. And that was that. And Mary and Martha would have known about it. And Lazarus certainly would have known about it. Maybe one or two other people around them, but that'd be about it. But the Lord allowed this thing to devolve to a place where not only is he sick, but he dies. Not only is he dead, he's been dead four days. Well, word gets around. And so all these people start hearing about Lazarus' death. And so they start converging on Mary and Martha to be with them, to console them. And so what was God doing in that? Well, he's building a platform. He's increasing it. More people are going to be involved in, more people are going to see, more people are going to experience what I'm about to do. And so that's another thing. Remember, if the Lord allows a protraction in your life, if there's some challenge or some circumstance and he's allowing it to extend, well, in that process, it allows more people to get involved, more people to become aware of it, more people to see it. And when he does that, then he's, when he does make his move, then those people are blessed by that. Well, the power and the pain, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come with her were also weeping. Now, the Greek here that John uses for their pain is klio, and it means to wail. I mean, it is a, it's a very expressive grief. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Now, the word that John uses for Jesus weeping is dakruo. It's different. It's to quietly shed tears. So Christ entered in, in, into their emotion, but he still has a different perspective on it. So he's grieving over it, but not out of control, not like all is lost. But he's entered into their pain, and Christ is grieving because they're grieving. And that's who God is. You never go through anything alone, separate from him. He's already entered into that pain. He, he saw it before you experienced it. So there's nothing touching your life right now that hasn't been through Jesus first. And there's nothing touching your life that he's not with you in. So you can know that. So whatever you're feeling, he's feeling that too. But his, but his perspective on it is different. He grieves with you, but he doesn't grieve as though he has no hope. He's not wailing this thing out. But he does grieve because that pain, it's hurting you, so it's hurting him. Now, remember, anger rises when a goal is blocked, and Yeshua was moved by the emotions of anger and compassion in this circumstance. He had come to bring the life of God, and he was angered by anything that stood in his way. And he identified with the pain of those held in bondage. You know, anger rises when a goal is blocked. What's his goal? His goal is to bring life and set us free from bondage. But right now you have people who are in the bondage to Thanatos, to death, and they're grieving and they're hurting. Well, that was not his desire. So there's an anger there. He's like, and he's angry at Thanatos. He's angry at evil. He's angry at death. And he's going to do something about that. You know, that's why Christ went with the religious elite, the religious leaders. When he became angered at them, it's because his goal was being blocked. His goal was that they would be saved too. But they refused. And so that angered him because he's like, I came here to save you. I came here to love you. And you just continue to reject my love. But he's angered by anything that stood in his way. And he identified with the pain of those held in bondage. And that's who our Lord is. In the prohibition, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. And it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead four days. I said, uh, it's kind of funny. The King James said, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> well, here's, here's the deal. When Christ identifies a barrier to life and freedom in our lives and commands its removal, we often initially resist him because we believe it will release something even more unpleasant in our circumstance. And so they're grieving and they're saying, our brother is dead. And Jesus wants to address that. 
Well, there's a barrier between them and Lazarus. Well, it's the stone. He says, take away the stone. And Martha goes, but there'll be an odor. Well, you know, when, when the Lord starts working in our life and we're grieving over something or we have a bondage or we have a pain or a circumstance and we call the Lord into it and then he comes, well, he's going to identify barriers. He's going to identify things in our lives that need to go in order to receive the fullness of that healing. But often initially we go, oh, wait a minute, that's going to be more unpleasant. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to look at that. Can't you just fix it? And so that's really what that's representative there. We always throw that prohibition out. Well, I don't know about that, Lord. That's, that's going to make this even more unpleasant. But it doesn't. It doesn't, ultimately. The prediction. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So in the kingdom of God, believing is seeing Thus, the only limitations that remain on what God can do through our lives are the ones that we choose to maintain. That's it. The only limitation on what God can do in and through your life are the limitations that you choose to maintain. If you want to keep it there, if you want to keep the stone there, you want to keep the barrier there, then so be it. it it'll stay and you'll have that. But if you're willing to allow the Lord to remove that from your life, then there are no limitations. He can do whatever he wants to do in you and through you. Well, the prayer. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. So a thankful heart is the key that opens the door to the power of God being released in our earthly circumstance, cultivating that thanksgiving. And you see that throughout the Gospels. That's what Yeshua did. You know, he gave thanks and broke the bread. And then there's a multiplication of the loaves and fishes. He gave thanks uh, in the upper room. He gave thanks and did this. He gave thanks. Christ always had a thankful heart. He's always thanking his father. And so that kept his heart protected and pure and kept that open channel, if you will, for Holy Spirit to be able to flow freely through him. But bitterness and uh, resentment and all of those things are barriers to that. So Christ was always thankful. He's thanking his father and he does that out loud. And that is releasing, it's opening a door from the heavenly realm into that circumstance. <clears throat> In the proclamation, when he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. One whom God helps, come out. And remember, the voice of God is the power of creation itself. When God speaks, something comes from nothing, Genesis 1, and life comes from death, Ezekiel 37, in the valley of the dry bones. So the voice of God is the power of God for creation. So Christ speaks. He is God's son. He is God. And so when he commanded Lazarus to come out, <laughs> ain't nothing but one, one thing going to happen there. He's coming out. In the presentation, the man who had died came out. His hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Verse 44, when God performs a work of restoration among us, it's not simply something at which we're to marvel, but it's a call to cooperate with him in releasing the fullness of its new potential to be presented, released, and experienced in the world. See, God did his part. He raised Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus came out, but he is still bound. He's in grave clothes. And Christ said, you unbind him and let him go. Again, there's that cooperation. He's saying, you engage with him, unbind him, uh, release the fullness of this miracle. Remember, God doesn't perform miracles just to wow us, but to woo us. You know, if, if, if God does something in your life that's profound, you see a, a guy who's been dead four days come out of a tomb. Hey, that's a wow. I'll grant you that. But if you walk away and that's all you got out of that, you missed it. Because you're not, he, it's not a circus act. He's not selling tickets to a carnival so that you go, man, that was really cool. But he does things in our lives to woo us, to call us in. 
He said, I raised him from the dead. You unbind him. And in our circumstances, there are things that God will do in our life, but it's not a finished work yet. It's not completely released. We want, he wants us to cooperate with him, unbind it. Let's, let's get this thing completely revealed, completely unbound. Let's release this into the circumstance. So stay with him in that. Don't just sit back and go, wow, isn't that cool? Join him in that and allow the fullness of what he's done to reach its potential. That's key. So that the rest of the world can experience that. And the product, and this is where we'll conclude in verses 45 through 46. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what he did and believed in him. But some of them, and that Greek there is ek, which means out of, some out of them or some from them went and Apercomai means to depart to go one's way. Some went and went their own way, continued in their way to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So one of the clearest revelations of the heart of human beings occurs when God does a great work among them. While the revelation of his power leads many to faith in him, others' hearts are more deeply hardened against him, further separating the two. And that's exactly what happened here. I mean, you can't be in front of a tomb and see a dude come out that's been dead four days and not be affected by that. <laughs> and so because of that, many did believe, like, okay, wow, this guy, all right. He, he, he's got it going on. I don't fully understand it, but he's definitely from God. And I, I do believe that he is sent. And I don't understand totally his mission and all about him, but I, I believe he's the, He's the one. But others, and it's bizarre to us, but others saw the same thing and their hearts were further hardened. And all they do is go talk to the religious elite about it. You know what he did? You know, he's raising people from the dead. He, this guy, Lazarus was dead four days. You know, that's a problem because he's making you guys look bad. What are y'all going to do about it? I mean, that's nuts. But that's where they are. Their hearts were so hard. And so when God does a work, and I really believe that what, whatever God's about to do among us, and he's going to do something profound. It's going to do this very thing. It's going to cause many to come to faith, but it's going to cause those who have continued to push him back to become more hardened. And there's going to be a greater departure between the two. You're going to see the difference in the light and the dark and the saved and the lost, because that's where it has to be. Ultimately, there's nothing in the middle. And so that's what the Lord is working toward. You know, in his patience, the Lord many times will do the little things in your life to, to soften your heart and prepare you for the bigger things. All of it's spiritual and all of it matters. Don't, don't live your life looking for next big event, next big event. That's not what I'm saying. But the Lord does do that because we see that through the Gospels. Most days were pretty average. You know, he's walking 30 miles to the next town. You know, stopping for lunch, you know, he's, you got to get dressed, you got to take a bath, you got to find food. I mean, it, you know, just life, living life. That largely, a lot of that's going on. But there were those moments when in the midst of that, he's walking on the water. In the midst of that, he's raising Jairus' daughter. In the midst of that, he's healing a blind man. So you have all of this together. But the Lord does these little things in your life because he's wanting to to prepare your heart and soften your heart. And so when you say yes to the little things, he's preparing you to be ready to accept the big ones. And so those who are in this moment, those who've had their hearts softened and they're, they're, they're seeking, they're asking questions, they're walking with him, they're saying yes to the little things, they're staying with him daily, their hearts were prepared for this big thing. But the other people who were there who were saying no to the little things, no to the little things, no to the little things. And then when the big thing comes, they're not ready for it and they reject it to their own peril. And that's the product there. That's the fruit of all of this. Many came to faith. His desires that all would have, but many of them did, but there were those who did not. Abba Father, we thank you so much for your living word to us today. It is a living word. And this scripture is as real right now as when John first wrote it. It's as real, Yeshua, as when you stood in front of that tomb and called Lazarus out. And we know, Lord, that you could do anything. Nothing is impossible with you. There is no circumstance that's too hard for you. Lord, there's some things in our lives that 
seem to be dying. There are other things in our lives that seem to be dead. Now, in the natural mind, we would say, well, that's it then. But you always say, but that's what then? There's nothing I can't do. I could have saved Lazarus from dying, could have saved him in the moment of death, brought him back after four days. I could bring him back after 4,000 years. And Lord, that truth encourages us and it reminds us not to give up hope. And so, Father, we thank you for this. And Yeshua, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You haven't changed and you never will. And so we can know by the authority of your word and the character of your heart that you've not forgotten us. There was a certain man who was ill. Lord, you certainly know what's going on in our lives individually and collectively. You know what's going on in our nation, in our world. You know every detail of it. You have a plan for all of it. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Lord, help us not miss the little things that you're doing in our lives to prepare us for the bigger things that come. It is your desire that you would take all of us to a new level of belief. That is your heart's desire, that we would live in a new normal. We, you're, you're showing us more of who you are and what you can do. But again, Father, we understand it's not just to wow us. It's not just for us to go, man, that's really cool. But Lord, you're doing that to woo us, to call us deeper into your heart, to become more like you, and to take all the restrictions and barriers off our lives of all the things that we think can't be done or you won't do or, or that are hopeless. And you show us that in you, all things are possible. So, Lord, thank you for this word of encouragement today. It is our hope. We stand on this word for 2023. And Lord, we're not trying to predict you or put you in a box. And I'm certainly not here to say you're going to do this on such and such a way, on such and such a day. I have no idea, Lord. I just know you. And that gives me all the hope I need. And I pray the same is true for everyone in this room. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you today.